So to start things off, uh, we're very happy to present the uh, second uh, CSCE award lecture. This lecture is, uh, this award is called the Ellen Russell Award. It was created at our last specialty conference uh, as a, a career award presented to someone uh, that's had a distinguished, long and distinguished career contributing to the construction industry. Um, and it was named after Professor Alan Russell. And we're very pleased to have Alan here this morning to introduce this morning's speaker. So I'll hand it over to Alan now. Thanks, Thomas, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's my distinct pleasure uh, to be able to introduce the first keynote speaker of the day, Dr. Roger Woodhead, who has most deservedly been selected for the 2015 version of the CSCE Ellen Russell Award Lecture. It's a bit awkward uh, talking about a lecture in your own name, it's, uh, but I'll get over it. Um, I've known Roger for many years, and I must say I'm a lot better for it, so thank you, Roger. Following receipt of his doctorate from the University of Calgary in concrete structure, Roger has had a long and influential career managing the design of large and complex projects. Over his 35 years of consulting engineering and construction experience, the last 30 years were spent in management. He's currently serving as the design manager for SNC Lavin on the Ottawa Confederation Line Public-Private Partnership Rapid Transit Project. He previously served as the technical director for the very successful Canada Line Rapid Transit Project. Some of you may even get to ride it in Vancouver uh, from 2005 to 2010, which was another SNC PC project. Amongst his previous assignments, Roger was the quality systems manager for the Vancouver SkyTrain Millennium Line which is a design-build project. He was the design manager for a section of the LRT-2 in Kuala Lumpur. And he was a technical services manager on the Hibernia gravity-based structure in Newfoundland. He has a pension for traveling around the world. Prior to those assignments, Roger was the chief engineer for a major construction firm, and he was based in Vancouver. Along the way, Roger has shared some of the lessons he has learned by way of a number of technical uh, presentations and publications. He is currently an adjunct professor at UBC. He has given very generously of his time to UBC's program of project and construction management. He has served on PhD committees. He has given lectures at the graduate and undergraduate level. And for the last few years, each year, he has given an inspiring lecture to the undergraduate case study of case studies of construction methods class. I had the opportunity to attend that in the last year and it was uh, extremely well received by close to 100 students. Uh, before I turn them over to you, there's three things you should know about Roger. There's probably more to Roger, but we'll just focus on three. First, he is an avid jogger in the early morning hours, even in the dead of winter in Ottawa. If any of you have been in Ottawa, in the deep of winter, you'll know it gets cold. His jogging regime has given him enormous stamina, which he needs in his job. He's an entertaining speaker who has honed his speaking and comedic skills over many years. We like to tease each other about that. Uh, but seriously, these talents have been very helpful in capturing the attention of the Ottawa City Council with his wit and sense of humor, which are vitally important you're dealing with weighty matters, always a little humor, humor helps to smooth the way. And last but not least, Roger exceeds in playing the part of a thin but loquacious and witty Santa Claus. So he's excellent at that if you ever need someone for that. With that, I give you Dr. Roger Whitney. Good morning, everyone. First of all, <clears throat> let me tell you how proud I am to uh, give this award. Uh, I, uh, and I'd like to thank Alan and whoever nominated me. I don't quite know why he did it, but uh, I'm very, very proud of it and I'm very, very honored indeed. So, imagine a world without voicemail. 
Imagine a world without personal computers. Imagine a world without the internet. Imagine a world without Starbucks. Imagine a world without Lady Gaga. Those were the days when I started work in Vancouver in 1973. So I was born in Yorkshire, England, Northern England. That means two things. Most of you won't understand a word I'm saying, but I have a few people scattered around who are Yorkshire translators. So anybody who doesn't understand what I'm saying, just ask one of those. The second item is that I have a most peculiar sense of humor. I've also got people scattered around who will laugh occasionally, when they start laughing, just join in. <laughs> so I moved to Vancouver in 1973, and this is a photograph of what was called a bee-in down in Stanley Park. This was in the days where Vancouver was hippie-dippie. Now, Alan doesn't like to have his photograph taken, but this is actually Alan standing at the back uh, I, it's the only photo I could get of him, and uh, that's it, I'm sorry. So here's a photograph of Led Zeppelin playing in the Pacific Coliseum, and I had to go to this concert in 1973. My children are all, always very jealous that my formative years were spent in the golden era of rock and roll, and they're very jealous that I saw Led Zeppelin when they were going at their full strength. In fact, I was a bit tempted to call this talk from the stoned age to uh, smartphones. <laughs> so I came to Canada in 1967 and I went to the University of Calgary, the best university in the world, by the way, to get my PhD. My PhD was eminently forgettable. In fact, everyone but myself has forgotten it. It was never cited by anyone else. Uh, for some strange reason, instead of going into academia, I decided to work in industry. And it was very difficult to find a job in those days. I suspect it still is for PhDs, because industry thinks that you are too theoretical. So I had a great deal of difficulty finding a job. I eventually got a job with a small consulting engineer in Vancouver and uh, started off my career designing buildings. I was there for maybe four years and I, was, I designed a building downtown, a large office building called Oceanic Plaza and the contractor who was building this building was advertising for, these were the days when they used to put ads in the paper when they were hiring people by the way. And so I, they, they were looking for a construction engineer, so I applied for the job and I got it. So I went to there and worked for a construction engineer, construction company, and the two jobs are totally different. One job, you were designing buildings, and the other job, you worked for a contractor who was trying to make sense of the design you did and actually trying to build this thing. I enjoyed working in construction because they treat their people a lot better than, than consultants, by the way. After about three years there, the original consulting company came back to me and made me an offer I just couldn't refuse to go back and work for them as their chief structural engineer. So I went back into consulting for about five years. Towards the end of that, the construction company came to me and made me yet another offer I couldn't refuse and where I went back to them as their chief engineer. One lesson I learned in that time, several lessons actually, but one of the lessons I learned was loyalty doesn't pay. Because when the company wants you back, they always offer you a much better job than if you'd stayed there. A couple of other things I learned is never organize the Christmas party. Because half the people don't like the food, half the people don't like the band, and half the people don't like where it's been held. So you've immediately got 150% of people who don't like what you've done. 
The other thing I learned, uh, this was in the old days where people had secretaries, uh, was to get along well with the boss's secretary because she generally ran the company. So lessons learned. Oh, another lesson I learned. They, uh, so I moved to Vancouver from Calgary because I thought it was a great city. I'd been here about two or three years and the company I worked for wanted to open an office in Edmonton and they wanted to know if I'd go there to open an office. And at first I thought, no way. But eventually I decided, yeah, I will give it a try and see how it is. So the job didn't work out, so I never did move to Edmonton. But my mantra ever since then is, never refuse a move because there's a 90% chance it won't happen. Uh, get a variety of experience, and I think to be working both construction and engineering has been a great asset in my career. And also, uh, my public speaking skills were absolutely atrocious. I took part in a press conference once, and the guy who'd organized it for us came to me afterwards and says, Roger, that's the worst speech I've ever heard. You, you've got to go and join Toastmasters. So I did, and I was a member of Toastmasters for many, many years. 1990, I went to work on the first major project I worked on, the Hibernia offshore oil field of concrete gravity base, and I was totally unprepared for it. I was way out of my depth. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I was really close to having a nervous breakdown, I would say. So this is this structure that's the first in the world that's designed to resist icebergs, and it's actually designed to resist the impact from a five billion ton iceberg, which is probably the size somewhere in between these two. I went to this, worked for this joint venture called Nodico, which was a joint venture of British and French companies, and it was a total disaster. They were fighting with each other all the time. It was kind of like the Battle of Waterloo all over again. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know how to build one of these things. Their, their North American partners were very weak. They were almost bankrupt. And they had two project managers, one who would come in from Paris for a few weeks, and another guy who would come in from Montreal for a few weeks, and they'd rotate. And I don't think they ever spoke to each other. <clears throat> so one guy would come in and immediately countermand everything that the other guy had told you. So it was a terrible way to run a job. As a result, the job went very badly. So I was originally hired as the site development engineering manager. This was in itself a $300 million project. I didn't have enough staff. And by the way, being a design manager is the worst job in the world. Because the first day you get on the job, you're behind schedule. And then when you actually manage to produce some designs after a few months, the construction team say to you, you expect us to build this? So this is an aerial view of the construction site. And uh, I lived in this bunkhouse for two years, which was one year, 11 months, and 29 days too long. These structures are built, first of all, the, the base of the structure is built in a dry dock. There's a picture of the dry dock being constructed. They're very, very large structures. This, uh, <coughs> this base is about 106 meters diameter, and this dry dock's 30 odd meters, 25 meters deep. So you basically build the base in that dry dock. You then flood it, and you hope the guys who've been calculating the weight, the buoyancy, have got it right because then it floats. You then breach the wall of the dry dock and you tow the base out. At the time, this was the largest structure ever towed in Canada or North America, weighed about 120,000 tons. It's then moored, moored to the shore and the rest of the structure, it's about uh, 100 meters high, is slip formed at this deep water site. So it's a very, very complicated process. You have to get everything out there on the water. This thing is floating in the water. It's moving around, uh, and it slowly sinks as you build it. 
Why are these gravity based structures being built? There's a bunch of stuff that sits on top of it that's got accommodation modules and some processing for the oil called the top sides. <clears throat> and the top sides on Hibernia, two of them, they was made of five large modules, two were built in Italy, two in Korea, and one in Newfoundland. So these were all stitched together on this pier. Uh, oops. So it, it overhangs this pier on each side. And when this is ready, and it weighs about 40,000 tons, by the way, a couple of barges come alongside this pier, and they jack up the structure so the weight's transferred onto these two barges. Very, very complicated marine operation. At the same time, the GBS, which has been completed, is sunk, so there's only six meters of freeboard on it. So at this time, the uh, hydrostatic forces on the base are very, very large, and one of these GBS has actually imploded and sank in Norway just as towards the completion of Hibernia. So you sink the GBS, you got the top sides on two barges, and you bring it alongside the GBS over top of it. <clears throat> you then raise the uh, GBS by deballasting it. It's been ballasted with water, and this raises it up and it picks up the top side. So just to go back to the contract, as I say, Nodico were one of the worst contractors in the world. So what I found was working in this situation, you learn, you learn a lot on a bad job. You learn a lot more in a bad job than on a good job. Yeah, eventually, the client who were oil companies decided that Nodico weren't going to be, finish this job, so they hired somebody else who was a joint venture of Kiwit and Norwegian contractors to finish the job off. Now, fortunately, these guys kept me on. So one of the things I saw was how jobs can be badly managed and how jobs can be much more, much better managed all on the same project. Usually when these changes happen, everybody gets fired. But in this case, the oil companies wouldn't let them fire everyone. And I, I was one of the guys who made the cut. So, the job actually got finished, it was a couple of years late, and here it is sitting out in the North Atlantic. So there was a time when the job was going badly, whether I wondered what I would put on my resume. Would I say I'd been in jail for five years? Would I say I'd been bombing around Europe for five years? Or would I say I'd been on, on UI for five years? As it turned out, when it was towed out and he started pumping oil, I kind of felt a little bit like a national hero, and I thought maybe I'd get the Order of Canada or something for doing this job. So, lessons learned from this project. First of all, check out who you're going to work for. Nothing prepares you for a large project like working on a large project. I was involved in document control early on, and 90% of the problems and complaints I had were to do with document control. After that, I've never been involved in document control. You learn more from difficult projects. On big projects, there's a lot of people. The more people, the more problems. And they're not technical. This was a technically difficult project, so there were technical problems. Well, 90% of the problems are to do with people. Bigger projects have got more people, therefore more problems. So communications are very important. You need good writing skills. I learned a lot about writing documentation on this job, which I use in future jobs. Never be afraid of a challenge. I was sort of ready to quit at one time early on, and I managed to hang in. I thought to myself, you are not a quitter, and uh, so never give up. So, 1995, I decided, I had the family with me in Newfoundland. Uh, my daughter who's here today was actually one, one and a half years old when we went there. So I decided, we decided it was time to come back to Vancouver and I was looking for a job here and I couldn't find a job. So I decided to set up my own consulting business, which I very cleverly called Woodhead Consultants. 
And the first major job I happened to get was in Kuala Lumpur, and I got some work there, consulting to SMC Lavalin. It was a cotton cover tunnel that they were going to use, build using slurry walls or diaphragm walls. I knew absolutely nothing about slurry walls and diaphragm walls, so I read up a few articles about it, and I went in to see the guy who was going to be my boss at SNC Lavalin, and I talked very knowledgeably about slurry walls from these couple of articles I'd read. Fortunately, he knew less than me, so I thought I knew something about it. As a result, I went to Kuala Lumpur, and this was an interesting project. So this cotton covered tunnel was going to be built alongside this river here called the River Klang. And the, the owner's design had the two tracks side by side. So that meant that you had to basically, it was wider than the river bank, so that meant you had to build this thing out into the river, and therefore you had to demolish the other river bank and keep the river back to the same width it was. SNC Lavalin had this very clever idea of stacking the tunnels on top of each other, which is the way the SkyTrain tunnels are stacked in Vancouver. So rather than them side by side in a very wide base, they were stacked on top of each other, which meant that they fit into the side of the, uh, in here. Um, so the other problem with this river, it can flood almost instantly. There's flash floods there, and the rain is up in the mountains. So Kuala Lumpur can be sunny and warm, and there's a big rainstorm in the mountains, and the river floods instantly. So this is a photograph of one of those floods. <clears throat> so we came up with this scheme of building this tunnel by first of all building the two diaphragm walls at the side, and then building the top slab and tunneling underneath it, building the intermediate slab and tunneling underneath that kind of top-down construction, it's called. There were also some his historical shop houses on one side of the tunnel, so one of the slurry walls had to be very thick and very stiff so that the ground movements were, uh, were mitigated. So this is a photograph of the slurry wall equipment we were using there. And here's an aerial view showing you the top of the tunnel just, just before the top slab's going to be caught, caught, uh, poured. And the old, the old shop houses were here. And there was very, very little movement of them, and also here. So, lessons learned on KL were, first of all, you've got to be reasonably aggressive about getting some work. So, I went in to see the project manager, persuaded him I knew something about Surrey Walls. What I didn't know, he was actually going to Kuala Lumpur that afternoon, so if I hadn't talked to him then, I never would have. I used a lot of the skills I'd learned on Hibernia, so we had to write safety plans, environmental plans, construction management plans, design management plans, and I learned how to write these things in Hibernia. And in those days, very few people understood and could write that type of documentation. Working overseas gives you a lot more flexibility. You have to learn to work with other cultures, which you certainly need in Canada anyway, and you need to be humble when you're in other countries. So let's move on to Vancouver again. So, the most difficult job I've worked on is Hibernia, no doubt about it. This is the most difficult job per dollar, because it wasn't a big job, but it was very, very difficult. This was a project in Vancouver Wharves where there were some dumper pits built, so the rail cars come in. In this case, it was sulfur, and the rail cars would dump sulfur into this pit, and then it would come out by a conveyor and get stacked up. And when you look across the harbour towards North Vancouver, you can see the yellow piles of sulfur. So we decided to build these caissons by building them on the ground and then excavating inside them. It's called the sinking caisson method. Because you are removing the skin friction from the inside, these caissons sink, supposedly. This caisson was 30, about 35 meters long by 25 meters wide and it weighed 5,000 tons. 
So here you can see a stand to excavate it using this crane, basically had a grab, and the, 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 the case on fills with water. So the guy who's doing the excavating can't see what he's doing. He can't see over that wall to start with. And anyway, it's all full of water. So he needs a spotter to tell him where to put his crane bucket. And he can see what's happening. The crane's lifting water and muck out. So we decided, we started to have some problems. That as we were sinking this, the ground around the outside of the caisson was getting sloughed down so it was sectionally getting itself underneath the caisson. So we were having to excavate this material as well. So this is some of the material that was coming out. And fortunately, I read the geotechnical report. The geotechnical report said the ground consisted of sands and gravels with some cobbles. So I went back to my old Tezagi and Peck geotechnical book and I found out the definition of a boulder. So a boulder is something that's more than 300 millimeters in one dimension. So there's a lot of boulders here. Also the definition of some is 25% of the material. Some cobbles is 25% of the material is cobbles. So we did a sieve analysis and found out that 35% of the material was cobbles. So therefore, we had a reason to say, well, the geotechnical report was wrong. Uh, this contract doesn't work anymore. And they only believed us. So we then moved from a lump sum contract to cost plus, fortunately. So this case on which weighed 5,000 tons got stuck. It was going to be sunk about 20 meters. We were down 15 and it was stuck. It wouldn't move. So somebody came up with the idea of drilling some holes in the corners. The difficulty of getting these things to sink is it's difficult to get that grab bucket into the corner. So somebody had the bright idea of drilling some holes down near the corners, putting some uh, dynamite in there and trying to blast material inside the caisson. And we had a pool in the office about how much this thing would sink when we, when we set off all these blasts. And the guesses range from 100 millimeters to 3 meters. Sometimes the drilling was difficult because holes opened up and the drill went into them. So when we did this drilling, it actually sunk less than 100 millimeters. However, we tried that about three times. And you can imagine this is very expensive. And also, the thing wasn't moving, we were stuck there. So the next thing we tried was we rented a big pump from the oil fields of Alberta to try and pump air down underneath those corners to blast the sand underneath. So here you can see what happens when you're actually pumping air down into that water. There's a lot of movement and within a day of this it started to move. So everybody thought, oh, this is the secret, we should have done this all along. But I checked on the geotechnical report and there was a, an area of very dense material that we had just passed through. So I'm not sure that this was the actual real reason that we started moving or whether we actually got into softer material. And here it is when it sank. So I did all the construction engineering on this and one of the things I had to check was Boyd said that when it was sunk and we poured a slab in the bottom and we dewatered it, that it wouldn't actually lift up out of the ground. Now the superintendent knew somebody who was a student at UBC, graduate student, and this guy also did some calculations on skin friction and the weight to this, and he said, oh, it'll lift. I said, no, it won't lift. So as soon as we dewatered it, I got a call from the site, from the surveyor, to say the survey was showing that it was lifting. And I thought, oh dear, maybe my calculations aren't that good. And he phoned me back 10 minutes later, no, no, it's a false alarm, it's quite steam. So he didn't lift, he stayed there. So, lessons learned, don't be afraid of new challenges. Use your engineering ba basics. Make sure you understand what's in the contract and never, never, never give up. 
So next, let's move on to the Millennium Line. One of the, one of the uh, skills I'd learned, if you call it a skill, by the way, on the on Hibernia was something about quality management. I learned something about quality management. This was back in the 1990s. Nobody in the construction business really understood what quality management was. Nobody wanted to understand what quality management was. The only thing they thought was it's going to cost us a lot of money. So when I started my own business, one of the things I did a little bit of consulting in was quality management. Uh, the Millennium Line was going to be built using first, I think one of the first projects in Canada built using an ISO 9001 quality management standard. So I, I joined up with a consulting company and we tried to, uh, we put in a proposal to be the quality managers on the job. And uh, once again, I persuaded them because of my experience on Hibernia, I knew all about quality management. By the way, now, I think I said that design manager is the worst job in the world. Quality manager is very, very close to being the worst job in the world. So when you're the quality manager, nobody likes you. The contractors don't like you, the consultants don't like you, your, your, your compatriots don't like you because you're auditing them all the time. So quality manager isn't quite as, uh, let's say, you're not in the, in, the, in the eye of the storm like the design manager. It's kind of easy, really. All you have to do is criticize people. But you've got to learn to have no friends at all. So here's a photo of the Millennium Line in New Westminster. It was built uh, generally using, a lot of it was built using segmental construction with a, with a uh, lifting beam there. And I think Ross Gilmore, who is speaking tomorrow, was the project director of this contract. Here's one of the stations there. It was the first time an extensive use of wood in stations, so we had to do some work to get uh, use of wood approved in uh, transit stations. And here you can see the train uh, rattling along. So lessons learned, use your experience from previous projects to market yourself. Working for the owner is a lot less stressful than working for the contractor. As I say, all you're doing is criticizing the contractor. In the audits, I learned how to give feedback non-confrontationally because generally you're telling people they're doing a lousy job and you have to tell them in kind of a nice way that they're doing a lousy job. And quality isn't a top priority in construction. Uh, I'm not sure things have got any better, but maybe they have. So let's talk a little bit now about Canada Line, which certainly is the most satisfying job I've worked on. As far as SNC Liveline is concerned, this is the Blue Ribbon project in their portfolio. It's the first P3 rapid transit project in Canada. It was very successful, as you hear. SNC Liveline played a very major role in it. They were providing financing with two pension funds. They were the EPC contractor, the design builder, and they're also the operator. So they had a very large role in the project, which meant that the decision making was quite easy. You didn't have a bunch of partners to ask about to do things, but also you carried all the risk. So they the way I got that job, by the way, is thanks to UBC, and I probably need to thank Alan or Tom for this, because I was giving some lectures at UBC about management, and I used to ask the uh, senior vice president with, UB, with SNC Lively to come along and give the students a talk one day, and we always called it what I didn't learn in engineering school. So this particular morning, he, he, we, he came up, and I, I gave him a ride up here, and I, rode, I drove him back into town. And on the way back, I said to him, are you free for lunch, Jim? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm free for lunch. I've got to do a couple of things, come away to the office with me. So we went for lunch, and uh, which I paid for, by the way, because I was just a grubby consultant. And he said, 
We started talking at lunchtime. Did I know anybody who was capable of being the technical director on Canada Line? I thought they already had a technical director, to be honest, so I was a bit surprised with this conversation. And we spent the whole lunchtime talking about various people who may be or maybe not handle the job. When we left the restaurant, we got just outside the restaurant, and he turned to me and said, Roger, how would you like the job? And within three seconds, I said, sure. And uh, so we negotiated for some time. The other good thing that happened was he phoned uh, an engineer that he respected a lot and that I know quite well and said, do you think Roger could handle this job? And this other engineer said, yeah, he'd be very good at the job, but I don't think you can afford it. So that immediately raised the bar as far as how much they were going to pay him. So as a result, I became the technical director on Canada Line, which has had a huge impact on my career. And as I say, I need to thank Alan or Tom for that. Uh, so it's not all been one way, by the way. So this is a contract that was built in a dense urban environment. It's got everything, all the civil works you could think of in a transit project. It's got an elevated guideway, it's got a board tunnel, cover tunnel, and some slab and grade. As I said, SNC Labley was a design build contractor. We were sitting in one office in downtown Vancouver. So decision making was very fast and very, very, uh, very good. We were also involved in joint ventures on the elevated guideway, SNC level, in at 50% of that joint venture. For the Boat Tunnel, there was another joint venture that SNC level, in at 50% of. And we did all, most of the design ourselves, and we managed a lot of the construction ourselves. So it was a project that SNC level, in were very much in control. So it cost about $2 billion. So the Hibernian project was about $1.5 billion in 1990 dollars, so that's probably worth more than $2 billion. Uh, it's a P3 project, there's a 35-year concession agreement for the operation and maintenance. It was completed 110 days early in August 2009. So one of the things you also need to understand is we had a penalty clause. We had to finish the job by November 30th, 2009 because of the Winter Olympics. And if we did finish on time, the penalty was $200,000 a day. So this penalty focused us totally on getting the thing done on time, on the schedule. Uh, it's been very, very successful. Uh, it was the, the the, the operator is paid by basically running the system with the right headways, about three minutes, and by getting the trains from A to B in a certain time frame and keeping everything clean. So as I, it was fast track, it had to be built 52 months, which was very fast for a project of that size. Needs a large variety of skills. You've got almost every type of engineer you can think of, electrical, mechanical, civil, structural, geotechnical. Uh, same with the contractors. Uh, the excavation for the downtown stations was some of the deepest that had been done in Vancouver to that time. And it was the first port tunnel in downtown Vancouver. So there weren't a lot of people in Vancouver who had a lot of knowledge or skills in that type of uh, construction. We also had the cotton cover tunnel down Canby Street, which was somewhat disruptive. So we had to manage the traffic, and there were all sorts of issues around business disruption. As the one of you, most of you who live here will know, the bridge over the north arm of the Fraser River is the first extra dose bridge in North America. Um, extra dose is some sort of Latin word, I don't quite know what it means. But this bridge is underneath the flight path to the airport. So that meant that, oops, that these towers had to be quite stubby and sharp. Also, there's a ship, ship traffic passing underneath it. So the envelope in which to build this bridge was very small. And that meant that the cables here are quite 
shallow. So these cables not only are lifting the bridge, but they're also supplying some extra post tensioning to it. So I always say it's called extra dose because there's an extra dose of post tensioning in it. The other issue we had, major technical problem, was down in Richmond, which is on the Fraser River Delta. The soils there are very soft. They're uh, what geotechnical engineers call loon shit. So in an earthquake, this soil would liquefy, and we came up with a very clever foundation technique that uh, actually saved us a lot of money. So the other thing I should say is, when I got hired on the job, my first day on the job, the boss said, there's two things I want you to do, Roger. And I can't remember the second, but the first one, he said, the foundations are $40 million over budget. You've got to save $40 million on the foundations. And I kind of say, well, not just me, but our team, we came up with this idea of the foundations that saved about $40 million. So that got me in his good books. Problems with these transit projects are engineers don't like to talk to each other. They like to work in silos. Their communication skills are very poor. So all these parts of the project have to be integrated with each other. So this is an automatic train control system. It needs to know where the stations are. There are CCTV cameras on the station platforms that transmit images back to the control center. And you've got all these other, other systems that have to uh, you know, join up with each other. People have to communicate. And all those arrows that were pointing across there, there were many days when I felt I was in the middle of this and all those arrows were going through me. So here's just a couple of photos of the segmental construction down in Richmond. Uh, some of the curves there were quite tight, and we had this truss that could kind of move sideways as well to build a station down there. Here's the cut and cover tunnel down Canby Street. The very deep excavation here, because once again we stacked the tunnels on top of each other so we could actually fit them in half of the street because we had to keep half the street open. So that's a very deep excavation there. And there's buses running over top. So I had a few sleepless nights about that. So one of the big things about these projects is the Boat Tunnel and the Breakthrough. So politicians love to see these events as a photo op. Problem is that you never quite know when the tunnel, when the TBM is going to get to the end. So about a month before you think it might get there, then your people start talking to the previous people about when this event might happen. And as time goes by, the date gets settled. Generally, it's on the weekend on a day where they think they'll get good press in the evening news. And so what, ha what really happens is you get the TBM, so it's very close to the end, say about four days before the big event, and then you just let it sit there until the big event happens, and then the Premier comes and shouts out, because our, so because our partner was Italian, he shouts out Avanti into a microphone, and it's got to happen quickly, and because people are not going to stand around for an hour waiting for this thing to appear. It's got to appear within five minutes, or you're toast. So here's some photos of the TBM breakthrough. There you go. So traditionally, when you broke through, the guys who were on the last shift climb out through those holes there and shake hands with the project manager. So here's the crew and the politicians are all waving at the cameras up there. The good thing is because they're Italians that they took us out to an Italian restaurant afterwards where we had copious amounts of red wine and some very good Italian food. One of the things that was in my mandate on that job was to get as an operating permit. 
first P3, first private operator in Canada. So it's the first time a private company have got an operating permit from government agencies. And we had some requirements in our contract as to what we had to do to get that operating permit. And what we had to do was produce piles and piles and piles of paper. And this is me with some of that paper around me. You produce all this paper and it's all boxed up and it gets taken to the lawyer's office and he sits in a conference room in the lawyer's office and various people from government agencies come in and kind of audit this paper and it, you'll get a phone call every day with a question about what does this mean, what does that mean, why is that missing, why is this missing. Uh, so bottom line is we did manage to get a permit to start revenue service 110 days early. It was a, certainly a big day in my life. Uh, the boss actually said thank you to me that night. So lesson learned, luck plays a part. Take the opportunity. So if I'd have thought what this job entailed, I would probably have um, not said yes quite so quickly. Because the hours are very long. You don't work nine to five on these jobs. I always say as a manager, you don't have to be the first person there in the morning. You don't have to be the last person out at night. But you have to be one of the first people there and one of the last people out. I use my lessons learned from all the previous projects about quality management, writing documentation, communication skills, there's lots of communication involved, both internally and externally. Especially these days with transit projects being in the center of cities, uh, communication, public communications is very, very important. It's not like the old days where engineers could just build anything and no, not worry. These days you need all sorts of uh, public communication and engineers very definitely work in silos. So just a few things about what I've learned over the years about skill sets of a good design manager. And I'm not saying I'm a good design manager, by the way. First thing you need is slightly above average technical skills. Now, you don't have to have very good technical skills because you need to keep the big picture in mind. People who are very smart uh, tend to not be managers of big projects. You need to be very calm because there's a lot of stress happening, a lot of crises, a lot of problems. You need very good leadership skills because these guys, it's not like the old days where you had a big stick, you no longer have a big stick. You have to persuade people that they want to work for you and that they'll do the work. You need to be very good at problem solving because you have lots of problems to solve every day. So your decision making skills need to be very good. I try and get lots of opinions as to what the best decision is, but sometimes I just make a decision myself. My philosophy is always the wrong decision is better than no decision. You need to be able to delegate because quite frankly, you then don't do anything yourself Every guy, everything gets delegated, and I think you need a good sense of humor. And you also need a very thick skin. <laughs> so I don't want to talk too much about the Ottawa project, but one of the things we did when we were bidding the Ottawa job is we kind of put a little bit of humor in our presentation. And that certainly differentiated us from our competition. I'm not saying that's what got us the job, but we tried to persuade the owner that we'd be fun to work with. We're not actually fun to work with when we got the job, but he kind of thought we were. So here you can see the uh, English team. You've got Becker, Woodhead and Rooney, the big three of English soccer. Uh, you've got the Rolling Stones with Woodhead and another guy in them. So, you know, we're a, te we're a team. We have a lot of fun. We're hip and cool. And we're also very flexible. By the way, this is a horrible photo that gives me nightmares still. <laughs> so this was to say that we're very flexible. Uh, Alan asked me to say something about linkages with academia, so I 
put a few things down here about maybe to make things better, the linkage between academia and, and the industry. One thing that UDC does very well is they have guest lecturers from industry. Maybe you get involved in industry in your research that some people here are very successful in. But you have to realize that industry wants results tomorrow, not in three years' time. You might ask them for research ideas. Maybe you take a sabbatical in industry. Uh, provide seminars that are of interest to industry. Uh, and become involved in a local industry group. So 50 years from now, maybe we'll go from smartphones to Wi-Fi in the brain. Just one final thing I wanted to say. I am 71 years old. I still work 12 hours a day. I have no intention of retiring anytime soon. I basically say I'm too old to retire. I've had a very, very interesting, satisfying career, and I wish all of you, especially the young people here, that you have a career that's as interesting and satisfying as I've had. Thank you.